Welcome to Centerpoint Church this morning. We have the honor and privilege of going before the Father in song and digging into His Word later on in this service. But before we continue on, let's check out what's been happening here at the church during DDC Discovery Day Camp. Thanks for that update. The kids had a blast and they got to hear about God's love this week. What could be better? Not much. Unfortunately, summer is coming to a close, which is sad. 
but exciting because in the fall, we have our ministry starting up again. So if you're interested in men's Bible study, ladies Bible study, if you're a kid, DDC Weekly, if you're a teenager, youth group, this is where you wanna come. So you can stay tuned in for details for those ministries because details will be coming soon. All right, let's go and to our time of giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So this can be done four different ways. You can go to our app and give there. You can e-transfer. You can go to our website to give online or you can mail your tithes and offerings to the church. All right, let's pray and give God the glory this morning. Father, we are so thankful for the privilege that we have to come before you, that you hear our prayer, that you want to hear our prayer. God, you are so good, and we are so thankful for that relationship that you offer us. And Father, we thank you for these tithes and offerings we're about to give you, because you've already given us plenty, and we are giving this back to you. And Lord, we pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings. Lord, that you would multiply them for your name's sake. We pray that you would be with Pastor Glenn as he speaks and that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is the number one reason that people choose not to believe in God? I found it to be this simple answer. Why does God, if he's so loving, allow so much pain and suffering? If God is good and God is in control of this world, why is there so much evil? Not only in the world around us, but also in our own personal lives. We've experienced this on a number of levels over the years, and we ask God the question, every generation seems to ask him the question, if God is truly who he says he is, then why are things occurring the way that they are? I find comfort in the Bible because God teaches us that this is not a new question. And as we're going through our sermon series called Fixer Upper this summer, we're talking about how God, who has begun a good work in us, will be faithful to bring it to completion until the day that Jesus Christ comes and takes us to be with him. But we know that the process of recovering from pain and suffering, the process of being built and grown, the process of being a fixer upper means that there will be seasons of life where we will go through tough times. Nobody wants to go through it. Nobody wants to have those renovations as it were. And yet, God does allow them for a very good reason and purpose. And today we're gonna be talking about the story of a man by the name of Gideon. And in Judges chapter six and onward, we read about the account of this amazing man. Not because he himself is so amazing, but because God was so amazing in his life. And as we examine the story of Gideon, I want to talk about those elements that we speak about when we're talking about fixing up a house. What makes it real and what makes it alive. Now, in the story of Gideon, we pick it up in Judges chapter 6. And we read that Israel has been under oppression for a number of years. It's a result of their disobedience to God. God warned them when he gave them his law that if they obeyed him, he would bless them. But he also told them that if they disobeyed him, that they would suffer his discipline. And Israel disobeyed God, followed other laws and other gods and other people's ideas of what God was. And as a result, they left the faith that God had given them and they fell into all kinds of sin. And God loved them too much to allow them to continue down that path because he knew that that path would lead to their own destruction. And so he chose to discipline them instead. And there was a group of people called Midianites. And these people had gained the victory over Israel for a number of years. But God steps in and in Judges chapter 6 verse 7, we read how he does that. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. A lot of people don't pick up the story of Gideon there. They pick up the story of Gideon when he meets an angel. We're gonna talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But notice how God speaks to them first. He reminds them of what he's done for them in the past. He reminds them that he's a God that is faithful. He's a reminder of the goodness that he brings into our lives. And so when Gideon and the people of Israel are reminded of this by a special prophet, God's telling them that he wants the best for them, but they're the ones that have strayed from the path. He wants what's best for them, even if they don't sense his presence in the moment. In other words, God's presence is real, even when we can't always feel it. Israel had been under oppression for many years. They had suffered from their uh, crops being stolen, from their people being physically oppressed, from them not having the freedom that they used to have. And even here, Gideon is busy threshing out grain, and that's the old way of harvesting. Before we have all these modern equipment that we have today in the 21st century, they would thresh out grain, but he did so down in a wine press. And the reason he did that was because the wine press was a little bit deeper in the ground. And so when he threw up his grain so that the wind would blow away the chaff, the Midianites wouldn't see it from a distance. They wouldn't see someone threshing out grain and go, oh, there's somebody with some food and we're gonna go steal it from him. So he was doing it in secret. And Gideon was a man who was suffering along with everybody else. And I'm sure he didn't know God's voice very well. As a matter of fact, when we pick it up in the next few verses, we realize that that's true. Israel failed to hear the voice of God, not because God was silent, but because they had disobeyed him. Not because God had moved away from them, but because they had moved away from him. In our own lives, how many times do we move away from God? And how many times do we suffer the consequences of our own actions? How many times do we disobey God and then get angry or upset at God because we're suffering? Gideon was suffering. And we today sometimes suffer. But God is faithful. And what God did was he first sent a prophet. He spoke to them. He reminded them of his goodness. He reminded them of what he had done for them in the past. And they should have repented and turned to him at that point. However, it doesn't appear that Israel en masse turned to the Lord. Even though God sent them a prophet, even though God loved them, even though God showed his presence to them by sending a special individual to share with them God's truth, so God goes and does the next thing. God goes the extra mile, as it were. And he doesn't just send a human messenger, but now he sends an angelic one. The Bible says here in verse 11, then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, of the clan of Ebiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the winepress, to hide the grain from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. God sends a prophet, they don't listen. God sent a prophet, even Gideon didn't listen. God reminded them that he had been there for them as a people in the past. God reminded them how he had rescued them from the Egyptians. But you see here in Gideon's response, even to this angelic messenger, that he doesn't believe that God really cares about him. He doesn't know his presence. He doesn't sense him. He's not real to him. But the beauty of this is, even though the people rejected God's word through the prophet, God goes the extra mile. God's persistent. And God's presence is so real here that we have it recorded for us over 3,500 years later. God is persistent in pursuing us through life. 
And in order for Gideon to experience God, he needed to get rid of something. We're going to read about what happens next. Gideon's desire to follow God is not very strong here. As a matter of fact, he doesn't believe what God says about him. He doesn't believe that he's a mighty hero. He doesn't believe that he's going to be used by God because he doesn't really know him. And the reason he doesn't know him is found in the next few verses. In chapter 6, verses 22 to 26, we read what he needs to do in order to be able to be used by God, in order to be able to experience the presence of God. In verse 22, it says, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord. See, up to this point, he thought it was just another regular person. But then God shows him that it's actually an angel. He cries out, oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I've seen the face of the angel of the Lord face to face. It's all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid, you will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. And the altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, and pull down your father's altar to Baal. And cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully, sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. In order for Gideon to experience God's presence even further, he needed to get rid of the idols in his life. In order for Israel to experience the presence of God in their midst again, they needed to get rid of the idols in their life. And for them, it was Baal, which is a old Phoenician word, which just literally means Lord. And Asherah was a female version of the gods that they served. And they had an altar and they had a pole that they used to worship on. And God says, take those and pull them down. Gideon, it's not enough to just offer a worship to me. It's not just enough for you, and we would say today, maybe to go to church and worship God. You also have to do something about your affections and changing your life. And so God told him to tear down that altar, to tear down that pole, and to actually use the pole as the fuel, burning it up in sacrifice to the real God, Yahweh, which is God is peace. You see, Israel didn't have any peace. Now today... We look at our world and we go, is there a lack of peace in our world? I think the answer is obviously yes. As a matter of fact, with every coming year, it seems that our society is more and more fractious. It's more and more angry. People are more and more upset across the political spectrum, at events and issues that are happening in life, and even amongst individuals. But God is peace. And where's that peace found? What's the message of the Christian life and what's the message of the church? Isn't it that Jesus is our peacemaker? Isn't it that we're to be peacemakers in the world around us? Not following along with what the world does? If we're experiencing the presence of God the way that God promised, then we should be God's presence to others and where we go, peace should go. And that brings us to another truth here is that we get so wrapped up in how we can try to fix what seem to be unfixable problems, we fail to trust in God. That's why Israel started trusting in Asherah poles. That's why Israel started trusting in altars to the foreign gods. What about us today? What are our gods? Well, we don't worship Asherah poles and we don't worship altars, a physical altar, but we sacrifice just as much to other gods, don't we? We sacrifice to gods of self-reliance and pleasure. Gods that say that we can decide for ourselves what truth is. We have ourselves as gods oftentimes. We put political leaders or we put uh, entertainment figures or we put other individuals up as gods in our lives rather than trusting in the God who is above all gods. And the Bible tells us in this account of Gideon that God's plan would be revealed to Gideon, but it's a reliable plan even when we can't comprehend it. In Judges chapter 6 
uh, we read onward as we see the scriptures, uh, we, see, we see the teaching here. It says this, then God said to Gideon, verse 36, or Gideon said to God, verse 36, if you're truly gonna use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out the whole bowl full of water. But then Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. Gideon didn't trust in God. Gideon didn't believe God's plan to use him. Today we look at people and we say, well, God could use that person. God could maybe use that person or that person's influential. That individual is important, but not me. Why do we do that? It's because we're judging with human eyes. We're judging with temporary eyes. We're judging with our own reasoning rather than God's reasoning. We're judging according to our standards, not God's. We don't believe that God's the power. You know, we've been talking about fixer-upper. When you look at a house, a house without electricity seems pretty dead, doesn't it? How many of us have been in a situation where there's been a storm? Maybe there's just been some construction problem and there's been a power outage. None of the appliances work in the house and none of the lights work in the house. And it's tolerable maybe during the day, but when it gets dark at night, it gets really bad. We get the flashlights out. We have to find other sources of illumination. We have to find other sources of power. Some of us might be blessed to have a generator, but most of us just have to suffer until the lights come back on, until the power comes back on, and it can seem like a very long time. But when we talk about what is electricity and what is power, none of us can actually physically see it. We can only see its effects. We can only see what it does. As a matter of fact, no one has ever seen an electron. No one's ever seen an atom. They've seen maybe the shell of an atom, the effect of an atom, but you can't actually look inside and see the protons, see the neutrons, and you certainly can't see the electron. And the reason we can't see them is because they are beyond our scope of vision, but their effect is very real. And in the same way, God's power might be beyond our scope of physical vision, but its effects are very real. And God's power here to Gideon was gonna be proved in the real world, even though Gideon couldn't see it. Now, famously, he asked for the test of the fleece. And he didn't do it once, he did it twice because his faith was so weak. In Isaiah 55, verse nine, we read, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And what that means is God is not bound to our notions of logic and sensibility. It doesn't mean that God is illogical. And it doesn't mean that God is nonsensical, by no means. But it's that he's elevated and higher than us. Just as when we try to explain to a child a complicated matter. Those of us that are parents sometimes get questions even from our kids growing up and maybe we're asking for a simple answer to a complex question. We can't give it to them in a way that they fully understand. Well, how much higher is God than us? How much above us is he? then we are above those that might not have as many years of experience or intellectual development yet. God says, listen, my ways are the best. My plan is the best and they're higher than yours. My thoughts are above yours and we need to trust God in faith. Not because God is untrustworthy, because we look at our lives and we see things going sideways and God says, I'm going to work this out. Don't worry. It may mean suffering temporarily, but I know that it's what's best because God is in control. And when we look back on it, just like we look back on these stories in the Bible, like the story of Gideon, we realize in the moment it was tough, but in the end, it was what was best. We need a miraculous intervention from God in our lives in order for him to show who he is. We need to know that God's power rests in him, not in us. We don't control him. We need to be led by him instead. The question is, 
do I follow my own plans or do I submit to God's plans for my life? Even when those plans don't always make sense to me, do I trust God to save me from my predicament? Do I trust God to bless me? Or am I trying to grab a hold of those things with my own force of will? It's not enough for us to just say the words. We have to actually put it into action. And for Gideon, he needed to do the next thing, which was not just to hear what the angel had to say and not just to believe in the tests that he saw answered for him, but he actually had to step out and do it. And that's what we read about next. God's power showed itself in a remarkable way. And Gideon couldn't control it. And in the same way, God's plan is remarkable, even though we can't control it. In Judges chapter 7, verse 21, we read how this worked out. Now, what, have, what happened, to just give us a summary, is that Gideon put out the word. He said, who wants to fight against the Midianites? And 32,000 men answered the call. That seems like a lot of men. But then when you look at the opposing army, it didn't seem like so many because the Midianite army was 135,000 in size. The Israelites didn't have the experience of battle. The Israelites didn't have weapons of warfare because they were the ones that had been oppressed by these people for many years. They had most of their stuff stolen. So you have an under-equipped, under-trained, and inferior army in terms of size, outnumbered four to one, that's gathered to do battle against these Midianites. But hope of success, well, it didn't seem like much. But maybe Gideon would prove to be an amazing general. Maybe they would come up with some really awesome military plan. But God said, I don't want you to do that. So he took them and said, I want you to ask everyone that's afraid if they want to go home. That seems like a crazy thing to ask an army that's ready to head into battle. But Gideon did it. And when he did that, 22,000 men left, which means he was left with only 10,000. 10,000 men against 135,000, outnumbered 13 and a half to one, and you're under-equipped, and you're under-trained. What hope did they have now? Well, maybe Gideon was still an amazing general. Maybe there was enough power in those Israelites, they would be able to overcome their enemies. But God didn't want them to take the credit. God didn't want them to think it was Gideon. God didn't want them to think it was themselves. And so what God chose to do in his plan was he was to whittle them down even more. So what he said was, I want them to go to the brook and I want them to go drink. And for those that took their weapons and put them on the ground and just started slopping up the water. They must have been pretty thirsty. Those people are not qualified to go fight. Only those who are prepared, only those who knelt down at the brook and with one hand cupped the water and kept their eyes open for the enemies, those are the ones that I want to go into battle. And of those 10,000 men that were left, only 300 made the cut. That's it. Now, 300 against 135,000, it doesn't matter what your military ability is. It doesn't matter what kind of plan the general has. You're pretty much going to lose. And yet God said, those are the ones I want to go into battle. So, we pick it up in Judges chapter 7. And it says this. Verse 19. And it was after, or it was after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon... And the hundred men with him, as he divided those three hundred men into three groups of one hundred each, reached the edge of the Midianite camp. And suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. And all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. And they held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands. And they all shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. And when the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. And we read that they fled in terror. How many people did the Israelite soldiers kill directly? None. None. God defeated them for them. Now, we actually read in this account that just a few hours earlier that night, God had sent dreams of terror into the Midianite camp. 
And these men woke up and they were afraid. They felt this sense of impending doom. They felt like there was an enemy ready to attack them and they were already primed for something bad occurring. So when they woke up later, because they all went back to sleep after this terrible dream, and they woke up later, they were already afraid. And when they heard these, these Israelites, they didn't know it was just 300, shout, and blaze their torches, they thought it was a mighty army. And in the confusion at night, they attacked each other thinking that each other were the enemy. What a remarkable plan. In other words, God did the work for them. And by the way, that's the same as what he did for them when they came out of Egypt. He rescued them from Pharaoh without them having to lift a finger. He did the same for them when they walked into the promised land. He knocked the wall down at Jericho. They didn't have to do a thing. And in the same way, you and I, it's not about our power. It's not about our strength. It's about God's power because God's power is far greater than our own. You know, the Bible teaches us in many parts of Scripture that it is the power of God that gives us the ability and the strength to be able to overcome whatever is in our life. When Israel was given the task of rebuilding the temple, they didn't have much. But the Bible says that the constructor of the temple was given this word by God in Zechariah chapter 4, that it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, is the, says the Lord of hosts. And here's the truth, is that while God's plan is remarkable, even when we can't see it, we can only appropriate it when we have faith. I think what's been lost in North American Christianity today has been the, this expectation of God's power. I think that we try to control God. We try to make our own power. We try to substitute it for the power that comes from the Almighty. You know, the truth of the matter is, if you compare the power that's in your house to the power that comes from the power grid, it is way different in magnitude. The most power I have in my household is flashlight batteries. That's it. And the most I can get from those is maybe a few volts. But what comes from the hydroelectric dam? What's coming from the hydroelectric dam isn't a few volts. It's millions of volts. As a matter of fact, it's so much power that it has to go through some transformers before it gets to my house. Otherwise, it would blow every single appliance out of its socket. God's power is like that. He then gives us enough for each one of us to be able to absorb. He doesn't blow us away with his power, although he could, but he chooses to judiciously put that power in our lives in order to help us, in order to save us and deliver us. And there is nothing in this world that is able to equal the power of God. No Midianite army, as it were. No matter what you see in the news, no matter what discourages you about the state of the world, and this is the testimony of every Christian, or should be, is that we're not flummoxed or we're not confused or afraid. Many people make bold prognostications. They say, I don't fear man, I fear God only. And yet every action that they take shows that they actually do fear people. They actually are afraid. They listen to lies or they listen to stories and they think it's wise, but really it's just coming out of fear. They look at their life and they say, I gotta fix this. And they've come up with their own plans rather than going to God first. And if God's gonna do this good work in us, as we're talking about in Philippians chapter one, and he's gonna complete it, it's him who's gonna do the work, not us. And that's why the faith that we express in Jesus is so important and that's what people need to see in our lives. Where does your power come from? Where does mine come from? Does it come from our efforts or does it come from faith in God? The testimony of every Christian is we serve someone greater than ourselves. The beauty of the church is not in its institutional power. It's not in the number of people who gather. It's not in the force of what we can apply in the world. It is the person who we serve. And that person is God. That person is revealed in Jesus Christ. And that's what people need to see. And the power of Jesus, the power of his cross to forgive us of our sin, to set us right before the Lord, to give us hope of eternity, this 
is the message of the church. This is the message of the children of God. And this is what the world needs to see. So what we learn from the life of Gideon is that a life of power is not based on our ability, but on God's. And the world doesn't see our muscle, but it sees God. And when the world sees God, their eyes are elevated upward And that's where hope is, that's where forgiveness is, that's where life is, and that's where we change. So as we consider these words, let us ask ourselves, is the power that is in our lives coming from our own efforts or from God's? I pray that we will be able to say with confidence that people will say, it's not because of your power, but the God that you serve that makes me believe in him. All right, Pastor Glenn, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Um, Church, people watching, hope you had a great morning with us as we were able to worship the Lord and to dig into His Word. We pray that you have an amazing week and we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us.